Hello, I'm Lisa Spooner, your instructor for this lesson called Attacks on Wireless Networks, which is part of the CompTIA Security Plus training course. It is super important to know what attacks are out there and what we can do to try to prevent them. We have already talked about wired network attacks like denial of service and man in the middle. Those all still apply to wireless networks. But in this lesson, we will be going over the attacks that target wireless networks specifically. We'll start by discussing two attacks where the attacker uses their own access point that they control to launch attacks on your network or your users. Those are called rogue access points and evil twin attacks. Then we will move on to war driving and war chalking, which are two ways for attackers to find and keep track of unsecured networks. Then we will talk about initialization vector attacks, which take advantage of the weaknesses built into older and weaker wireless encryption methods. After that, we will revisit packet sniffing and see just how dangerous plain text transmissions can be. Bluetooth makes a tiny wireless network, and it has its attack types too. So we'll talk about bluejacking and blue snarfing. And last, we will discuss intentional wireless interference. And the exam objective for this lesson is analyze and differentiate among types of wireless attacks. Let's get started. A rogue access point is one that has not been authorized by the network administrators. Now this could have been innocently done by an employee that thinks they are just improving their work conditions. But even if this is true, their configuration still probably does not follow your security policies and the AP could be easily found and exploited by an attacker. Or even worse, that rogue access point could have been installed by an attacker with physical access. Now with this access for an extended or indefinite amount of time, the bad guy could do all sorts of attacks, even ones that take a longer time to run, like key cracking programs. You will want to find any rogue access point sooner rather than later. If you have an intrusion detection system set up that is monitoring your wireless network, rogue APs can be spotted in pretty much real time. Otherwise, you want to regularly check your network to make sure that only the access points that your network admins have created are present. And to know which ones are yours and which ones are rogue, you can compare what you find to a documented baseline of all the access points and their SSID, MAC address, and other attributes. An evil twin is an attacker's access point that that attacker wants users to connect to instead of the legitimate access points. Most often, evil twins are set up by attackers in public spaces to entice whomever and to see what they can get. These will even have fake login pages in an attempt to look more legitimate. So if your employees will be logging into Wi-Fi networks at hotels or coffee shops or other hotspots, they should be taught about the existence of evil twins. Tell them to always ask for and to use the directions directly from the location's employees instead of assuming that they are connecting to the correct network. And as always, be sure to have good mobile device policies that include whole disk encryption and encrypted communications back to the office. But an evil twin can specifically target your network. Maybe it spoofs the MAC address of a real access point. An attacker might even try to take down or interfere with the real access point so that theirs are the only ones available. The bottom line is the attacker's goal is to get users to connect through their access point then all of the traffic can be captured and analyzed, and if keys are obtained, the attacker could set up a man-in-the-middle attack or any number of other despicable activities. So be sure to educate mobile users about the possibility of evil twins and regularly look for them in your own environment. War driving is driving around looking for access points to open or weakly encrypted wireless networks. If the war driver is just looking for free internet access, this is not so bad. But an attacker with more malicious intentions should not be able to have access to your network. So the most important thing you can do is not have any open access points and to use strong wireless encryption. So what the war drivers do is drive around with three things. One, a laptop with its NIC in promiscuous mode. Two, specialized equipment that is most often homemade that pinpoints where the Wi-Fi signals originate, and three, war driving software that analyzes and logs the wireless networks that it finds. Modern war drivers even use GPS to log the exact location too. The war driver might just document all this to come back later, 
or they could set up shop right then and there to use the free internet or to launch an attack. Now driving is not the only method. There is war walking, war strolling, and even war flying. I guess you could do war biking, but that would be a bit conspicuous. So if you see any unfamiliar people and vehicles parked or driving slowly around your company's building or campus, they could be war drivers. And this could happen at any time, especially off hours. Oh, and be sure that any security personnel are educated about war driving and war chalking, which we'll talk about next. You can also do some war walking yourself to survey your own environment before the attacker does. Heck, you might even find a rogue access point or an evil twin. But again, the most important thing you can do is to properly secure your wireless networks to make sure that even if war drivers do come around, they find nothing worth pursuing. War chalking is using symbols, most often written in chalk, to mark the location of wireless network access points. This could be for future personal use or to let other war drivers know. Now you might also see war chalking symbols used on permanent signs that are advertising free Wi-Fi. If you're going to come across war chalking symbols in the real world, chances are they will be in the form of this more mainstreamed version. But the reason that war drivers would write war chalking symbols is to save time, because the longer an attacker hangs around a location, the more conspicuous they become. War chalking saves time because the location and the details of a wireless network are already spelled out. So the attacker can move right on to the next step of using the free internet access or launching their attack. There are an agreed upon set of symbols that war chalkers use. For an open node or access point, the war chalker uses two open half circles pointing away from each other and notes the SSID and bandwidth. For a secure closed node, a completely closed circle is used and just the SSID is listed. Now this is what any war chalking at your company should look like, right? Then for the easily crackable web networks, a W is put inside the closed circle, and the access contact for that network is also listed along with the SSID and bandwidth. So if you do see any of these war chalking symbols around your company's buildings, take note of what they say, wash them off immediately, investigate any possible open nodes they refer to, and look for signs of other attacks. An IV attack is an attack utilizing the initialization vector of weak encryption methods. That's IV, not Roman numeral 4. The initialization vector is a number that is applied to the shared key to change the key sum for each transmission. Because if you are always using the same key to encrypt your data, the longer that the key is in use, the longer the attacker has to try to crack it and then use it to decrypt your messages. IVs are designed to let both sides use a fresh key every time and it is supposed to be used to reduce predictability and repeatability of encryption keys. But the IV is vulnerable if it is too short, exchanged in clear text, and often repeated, which is exactly what happens with WEP. WEP, the wireless equivalent privacy, is the older weak wireless encryption standard, and WEP is an example where IV attacks are used to crack the encryption. And there is a bunch of software available for attackers to do this easily. WEP uses the RC4 algorithm, which only has a 24-bit long initialization vector, which is short. So the same IV does get repeated with some frequency. The attacker's cracking program examines the repeating IV's data stream to figure out the secret key. Let me show you why this works. All the nodes in a wireless WEP network share the same secret key, which in itself can be an issue. And an IV is applied to this key to create a temporary key stream. This key stream is used to encrypt the plain text message, which is then ciphertext. But before the ciphertext is sent from the originator to the destination, the IV is added to that frame in plain text. This is so the destination end can create the same key stream on their side to decrypt the message with. An IV with 24 bits only gives you just over 16 million different key stream possibilities. So eventually you will have more than one data stream that uses the same IV. By examining those, the attacker can deduce what the actual key is. And an attacker can actually force this by using cracking software to inject those 16 million frames over and over and over to get a bunch of data streams with matching IVs. And furthermore, these are their messages so they know exactly what the clear text is. 
So they have the clear text, they have the initialization vector, so finding out the key isn't too hard at that point. And once they have the key, your content can be stolen, and man in the middle and other attacks can be launched. So the mitigation for IV attacks is of course do not use WEP for your wireless network. Actually, newer devices don't even offer this as an option. Good riddance. Wireless networks are vulnerable to packet sniffing just like wired ones. But in a wired network, in order to use a sniffing program, the packet sniffer needs to be running on a computer that is inside the corporate network, like one that the attacker has physical access to or one that's been compromised with a Trojan or other malware. But this is a whole lot easier if you have an open or weakly encrypted wireless network. So let's take a look at what eavesdroppers with sniffing software or hardware can see. POP3 does authentication for email service, that's usernames and passwords, in clear text. Web-based email providers can be sniffed if no SSL or TLS encryption is used. And as you know, FTP does no encryption. Sniffers can also see exactly what websites you are visiting with HTTP. And they can see your unencrypted IM chats as well. And I don't even need to put Telnet on this list, do I? For your wireless network, have layers of protection. Use strong wireless encryption, don't broadcast the SSID, and do other wireless hardening best practices. On top of that, independently secure all services. Turn on any optional encryption, use VPNs, and don't use unsecure protocols. And don't forget, you can and should use sniffers and other network monitoring tools yourself to locate vulnerabilities. Detecting rogue packet sniffers on your network is not an easy task. By its very nature, the packet sniffer is passive, so it isn't going to have any signatures and might not throw any red flags. You can try looking for nicks in promiscuous mode as one place to start. Next, let's talk about attacks on Bluetooth. Blue jacking is unsolicited messages over Bluetooth. Think Bluetooth spam. Blue jacking can happen when a Bluetooth device is set to discoverable. Even worse is blue snarfing. This is the unauthorized access to a device through Bluetooth. Blue snarfers can steal contact lists, calendar info, emails, texts, and even images or video. Now this isn't nearly as frightening as it sounds. Just because a device has Bluetooth doesn't mean that it's automatically vulnerable to blue snarfing. Blue snarfing is really only possible on the more simple PDAs, mobile phones, and tablets. This is a device by device issue, so make sure to know the model of all the mobile devices that are used by your employees and could have sensitive information on them. And then look up each one to see if any have known blue snarfing issues. If there are, the only way to be completely safe is to turn Bluetooth off, not just set it to undiscoverable. Now let's talk about wireless interference. Wireless signals can be corrupted or interfered with, and this can lead to a degraded service or a completely broken denied service. A possible reason an attacker might do this is to get rid of your legitimate access point so that the attacker's evil twin access point will be used instead. But to cause interference to wireless networks on purpose is illegal in the United States. And there are numerous devices out there that can cause interference, like other 802.11 wireless networks or even microwave ovens, cordless phones, and fluorescent lights. That is why you need to be careful when setting up your wireless network to make sure that none of your own equipment or cabling are causing interference. But jammer tools can be purchased or made by attackers to do more targeted wireless interference attacks. Spectrum analyzers are available to see if something is interfering with your wireless network. These are kind of complicated, but with a little practice, you can recognize interference. Then, move your access point, change the frequency of the access point, and or boost the access point's signal. You can make these changes to keep your users connected while you go and hunt down the source of the interference and notify law enforcement if the interference is intentional. For this lesson, I have two quick pages of key terms that you should know about attacks on wireless networks. Make sure to go back and study any that you are not completely sure about. In this lesson, we covered the types of attacks that target 802.11 wireless networks. First was unauthorized rogue access points. 
then evil twin access points that try to entice users to connect through them so that they can analyze that traffic. After that, we went over war driving, which is looking for wireless networks to exploit, and war chalking, which is marking where those exploitable networks are. Fun fact, war driving and war chalking are named after the older war dialing technique popularized by the old movie War Games. Love that one. Then I gave you an overview of what an IV attack is and how it can be used to crack weak wireless encryption. We also reminisced about packet sniffers, and I gave you an example list of some of the things that attackers can see if they get a sniffer on your network. Next was Bluetooth attacks. Blue jacking, which is Bluetooth spam, isn't nearly as scary as blue snarfing, which is unauthorized access and theft of data from a Bluetooth device. And last, we talked about wireless interference that is illegal if done on purpose to degrade and bring down your wireless signal. Now, after watching this lesson, you know why we should teach our users to never connect to an unsecure network. And you know exactly what you're up against when undertaking securing your wireless network. Thanks for watching.